Hello everyone, I'm Vikram Chandra and you're watching The India Story, the one show where we bring the top stories from India to a global audience. Our focus on the show today, FBI Director Christopher Wray will visit India next week. This at a time when the US government is investigating what it calls an alleged plot to assassinate Sikh terrorist Gurpatwan Singh Panun on American soil. Now, India is also going to have its own message for the FBI director to say, investigate Panun and bring him to justice, bring him to justice for the statements he's making on terrorism, inciting violence against Indian diplomats, threatening to blow up planes, and hey, threatening to blow up the Indian parliament. Now, we're going to have a very special exclusive interview on the show. We're going to be talking to the former Attorney General of India, Mukul Rohatki, one of the finest legal minds in India. And he's going to be telling us why he thinks India has a cast iron case to make against Panun, to have him brought to justice. The other big story that, of course, all of us have been tracking, state election results, BJP swept the Hindi heartland, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. The Congress did well in Telangana and a regional party won in Mizoram. But what does all of this mean for the 2024 general elections? Let's face it, that's one of the big questions all of you, wherever you are in the world, are going to be tuning into the India story to ask the answer for that big question. Who's winning in 2024? Well, after these assembly elections, looks more and more likely that it could be Narendra Modi. But... Could the opposition get together? Could there be a twist in the tail where well, they're going to be joined by multiple experts across all political parties to give us the answer to that particular question? Also, a special interview on the India story. We're going to be speaking to Sharmishta Mukherjee, author, former Congress leader. Uh, she isn't in politics, of course, now. She's, she's left the Congress party, but she is releasing a book on her father, the president of India, Pranab Mukherjee, uh, who, of course, is a very, very notable politician. Some interesting things in the memoir. We're going to be talking to her about that. But before we go to any of that, let's just quickly take you through the major headlines. The Lok Sabha on Wednesday passed two key bills that seek to nominate two members from the Kashmiri migrant community and one representing the displaced persons from POK to the Legislative Assembly. Another bill for reservation in jobs and admission to professional institutions to members of the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and other socially and educationally backward classes was also passed amid an opposition walkout. The bills will now be taken up by the Upper House. DMK MP DNV Senthil Kumar drew widespread condemnation from various parties including BJP and Ally Congress after he described the Hindi heartland as Gaumutra states. Kumar's comment which he made in the Lok Sabha came following BJP's victory in the three Hindi heartland states namely Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. He later took to Twitter and issued an apology. At least 13 people were killed after a gunfight broke out between two militant groups in Manipur's Tenknopal district on December 4th. The victims, whose bodies have been found, are believed to be cadres of the value-based insurgent group People's Liberation Army, which is banned under the UAPA. An official said that a group of militants on their way to Myanmar were ambushed by another group of insurgents dominant in the area. The official said that no arms or ammunition was found near the bodies. India, as per SNP, will be the world's third largest economy by 2030, eyeing 7% GDP growth by 2026. The rating agency emphasizes on unlocking manufacturing potential, boosting logistics and upskilling the workforce. India, which is currently the fifth largest globally, is projected to hit $5 trillion economy by 2027 to 2028. SNP also highlighted challenges in geopolitics, urging policy clarity for investment opportunities. 
Well, let's turn now to our special focus and that big exclusive interview that we have for you. The American FBI Director Christopher Wray will be visiting India next week with a team of legal and intelligence experts. This after the U.S. charge an Indian national, Nikhil Gupta, of working with an unnamed Indian government employee in an alleged foiled plot to kill a designated Indian terrorist on American soil. Now, this is an important visit happening after 12 years and it's the first visit by Ray since he took charge in 2017. The FBI director will reportedly meet top Indian security officials, external affairs minister S.J. Shankar, the NSA Ajit Doval, the NSA chief, the NIA chief, top officers of RAW and other intelligence agencies. At least that's what we're picking up from the press. Now, the U.S. may well have its talking points. The U.S. is expected to be talking about that entire alleged plot to kill Panun and say, hey, you can't come and do this on American soil, and that may, may well happen. Uh, we, of course, don't know the agenda for sure right now, but that's what we expect will happen. But India is also likely to have a strong and direct message to communicate. India is expected to ask the United States what it plans to do to bring this man to justice, Panun, the man who is at the heart of the U.S. allegations, the man whom India accuses and doesn't just accuse, the man against whom there is direct evidence, including in his own words, making threats to blow up airliners, to harm Indian diplomats, and most recently, to blow up the Indian parliament, to attack the Indian parliament. Now, there are many issues out here, so let me just unpack them for you a little bit before we turn to our special interview with former Attorney General, top lawyer, Mukul Drohatki. First of all, let's start by Panun himself. Now, just take a look at him. You could call him a joker, you could call him a cartoon figure, you could say he's a clown. Many people have done just that. Many of them said, is this really a, a terrorist whom you should seriously be concerned about? Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's, let's forget. You may think he's a joker and a clown. What matters is not that. What matters is not the capabilities that he has. What matters are the threats he's making against India and the direct threats of terrorist action that he's putting out there in the world. And I think it's a very important thought experiment that needs to be done. Many people in the rest of the world say, why are the Indians so concerned about this? Why is India prepared to take such a strong stance on this? But I think at the heart of it is a basic question that needs to be asked. Supposing the shoe was on the other foot. Look, you can't have double standards. Let's do a thought experiment. Supposing the shoe was on the other foot. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that there was an Indian citizen, a self-proclaimed member of Al-Qaeda, an Indian citizen sitting, let's say, in Kerala or in Madhya Pradesh or some part, some part of India. There's an Indian citizen sitting there and directly making video threats saying, we're going to do 9-11 again. I'm going to do a repeat of 9-11. How would the United States or Canada react? If the only Indian response to that was saying, hey, you can't send American agents in to kill this man or assassinate them, that would be a very serious affront to Indian sovereignty. What would the US say? What would Canada say? What would Britain say? They'd say, all right, fine, maybe we shouldn't come in and kill this person in Kerala, but can you do something about him? He's making terror threats against our interests. He's threatening to repeat 9-11. Exactly the same thing would happen if you had a... a I'm giving you another hypothetical example. Uh, American citizen who is, let's say, a member of Hamas, saying that I'm going to repeat October 7th. How would the Americans react to that? So India's essential point is, you can't have double standards out here. If terror is terror, you've got to act against terrorists. And you've got to act against people who are making terror threats. And if they are your citizens on your soil, and you don't want so-called death squads coming to assassinate them, that's fair enough, that's a, that's a fair thing to say. But at least the first thing which you should do is take an action against them. And I think that's the point that India will presumably uh, be, be committing. India is going to be asking the United States, what will the US do? And if you can't assassinate anybody, and perhaps you can well agree that you shouldn't be assassinating people in friendly ground. And India, of course, is very clear. This is not our, in, in, been India's policy. We've never thought of assassinating anybody. Uh, that's clearly the Indian position, which they will repeat. But then the question will remain, what are you going to do about this man? 
By the way, the entire question of death squads or as alleged assassination attempts and did it happen or did it not happen and how high up did it go if it did happen, those questions will be raised by the Americans. And let's face it, there are things happening in Pakistan which of course are also raising their own questions um, because a number of people are continuing to be killed by unknown gunmen in Pakistan. At least two major lashkar e toiba uh, terrorists have just been killed in Pakistan. But that's another separate question which will roll out at some point, which maybe we will turn our attention to in another episode of the India story. Something else that may well come up in the next week, especially when the FBI director is here in India, is this entire question of a differential reaction. This has been asked and the Ministry of External Affairs has answered it. The Minister for External Affairs, uh, S. Jay Shankar, answered it directly on the floor of the House. Why has India reacted differently to the United States than it did to Canada? Well, two reasons, I guess. Number one, the U.S. is the U.S., Canada is Canada, India has a different strategic relationship with both of them, so maybe that also covers the reaction. Point number two, the way the U.S. put it compared to the way China, Canada put it, we've discussed this on the show in the past. But the third, the official statement now made by the government of India, the Americans have put forward some concrete evidence and have shared it with us, and again, maybe the FBI director will do it. The Canadians haven't given any specific input. That's essentially what S. J. Shankar said also. U.S. is concerned. Certain inputs were given to us as part of our security cooperation with the United States. Those inputs were of concern to us because they related to the nexus of organized crime, trafficking, uh, and other matters. So because it has a bearing on our own national security, it was decided to <coughs> institute an inquiry into the matter and an inquiry committee has been constituted. In so far as Canada is concerned, no specific evidence or, inf or inputs were provided to us. So the question of equitable treatment to two countries who have one of whom has provided inputs and one of whom has not, does not arise. Well, for more on this, let's now talk to probably one of the finest legal minds we have in India, the former Attorney General uh, of India, one of the country's top lawyers, Mukul Rohatki. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rohatki. It's always a pleasure and a privilege uh, speaking to you. Now, as you've been hearing this entire conversation that's taking place between the US, Canada and India uh, over this entire Panun question, alleged assassination plots, uh, FBI director is going to be coming out here. Uh, I'm, I'm actually curious, what does international law actually say about issues like this? Um, Mr. Rothke, when you talk about the rule of law, what does the rule of law say about cases like this? See, I, I mean, before we come to the law, from whatever I have seen in the papers, uh, there is no doubt that Mr. Pannun is a person who is wanted in India for several crimes. Yeah. He is an accused in several cases in India. He is a staunch Khalistani. He has been making and issuing grave threats, sometimes to blow up an Air India plane. The most recent thing I found was horrific to say that I will deal with Parliament of India and so on and so forth. So there is no doubt that, uh, you know, he is wanted in this country. As far as India is concerned, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, we don't have a policy of having a Mossad type of agency like Israel to hunt down and kill people who are opposed to India or opposed to the sovereignty of India. So this kind of allegation by the US in conjunction with Canada, I think is absolutely nuts. This seems to be a, a kind of a cross crossfire in the sense that such kind of people will also have enemies within their own groups or organizations or community, etc. And some other material may be available, I don't know. But there is no way that the government of India can be alleged to have a plot for killing somebody, etc. Now, if the FBI is going to examine the matter, 
as far as government of india is concerned the government of india must make over all the information it has regarding the activities of mr pannu not only his involvement in subservient subservient activities in india whether it is in amritsar or elsewhere even his activities abroad which are targeting indians indian diplomats in canada and america a full dossier should be made to show that he is a, a criminal you can call an international criminal who should be tried not only by fbi but by international criminal courts so let me just take you up on that a little bit further we sometimes hear from politicians from from leaders in canada and analysts in the united states that look there are freedom of speech issues out here people uh, in countries like canada or the us can get away by saying x y z but because they are covered by the freedom of speech now i want to get your legal opinion on this what what panun has been saying and doing if if they if he's making a direct threat for example against indian diplomats if you're saying you're going to blow up an airliner if you're making a a a, a threat uh, against parliament and let, let's face it these are credible threats because the groups that panun has been associated with have actually blown up an airliner in the past in 1985 they blew up that air india airliner so it's not just a a threat in the air these remarks that are being made does it come under freedom of speech or is it actually a violation of the law is it an incitement to violence and is it an open terror threat that has to be dealt with as a terror threat i entirely agree with you vikram in no country however much the right of freedom of speech may be guaranteed by the constitution as it is in india too and as it is in the us or by convention in the uk and some other countries no country can allow such kind of utterances to attack parliaments of different nations blow up planes attack diplomats say that their security will be threatened by such kind of people these are downright terrorist activities and terrorist utterances no amount of freedom of speech however latitude a particular country may give to freedom of speech everything in this world has certain borders there is nothing which is absolute no freedom is absolute to go and you know do these kind of things according to me this is an offense what he is doing even on the us and canadian soil those countries should take such people to task All right, Mr. Rohit Gay. Now, of course, the the FBI director is going to be out here. India is presumably going to be making a certain case uh, against Panu and, and and others like him. Now, I have to ask you: You've been Attorney General for so many years. If you had to make the case to sort of tell the Americans or the Canadians that look, you're saying follow the due process of law, follow the process of law, and if you have enough evidence and you make a good case, then we are going to be taking action on that under the rule of law. If that's what the U.S. and Canada are saying, then fine, that case needs to be made. Under which laws and under which system do you think India can make a legitimate case that the U.S. and the Canada and other such countries have to take action against people like Panun? What would be your? How would you make that case? That according to me, it's very simple. forget what he wants to do in india let us stop what he is threatening to do in canada and the us because he is on that soil and he has dual citizenship of those countries from whatever i have read now if you are making open threats to kill people there destroy or harm the indian missions in those countries harm the diplomats and their families it is obvious that the local laws of that country will take action as any any country would i mean if somebody is in india and who makes these kind of threats we have our penal laws to take action so the penal laws in america and canada will provide enough uh, uh, basis for the law to take action against such people because it is a threat to kill a threat to commit a murder uh, from an organization which has had a particular amount of uh, uh, similar background as you have said so what more is required the utterances are there 
and to say and, and i have been seeing on tv some people who are uh, of that bent of mind who are egged on by these kind of people who go to gurudwaras and heckle our diplomats and all that and you know these diplomats have to go away etc this is clearly a threat to security of individual security of the property of a sovereign nation and an attempt to to threaten their families according to me it is an open and shut case what are these countries waiting for what is this kind of rule of law what is this kind of freedom of speech that you are inciting these kind of uh, things to happen against a sovereign nation and its diplomat so you are essentially saying that their own laws can be quoted to say that you got to take action uh, again against somebody like panu but in addition are there elements of international law that india can can draw on for example the vienna convention which says that the safety of diplomats is sacrosanct see as i told you india will certainly invoke the vienna convention for diplomats and their safety but more elementary than that is that you invoke normal criminal jurisprudence in america and canada and say that individuals forget that they are diplomats individuals are being threatened in this fashion by an individual who is a resident of america and has a citizenship of america and therefore action should be taken it has nothing to do with what happens in pakistan or this that or the other it's as simple as that we don't need to look at any other law All right, Mr. Rohit, thank you so much. Got it very clearly what what you're saying, and um, you know, hopefully, those in position of power will be listening to some of this and uh, perhaps framing the appropriate reply, replies and responses to the FBI director when he's here um, next week. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's now turn our attention to politics, and I'm sure all of you, of course, are. very familiar with the results of the assembly elections last week where the bjp swept those three states in the in the hindi heartland the congress picking up telangana and a regional party winning in in mizoram but now the big question is what does all of this mean for 2024 what does it mean for example for the india alliance and that perhaps was one of the high points of the the india alliance all on one stage saying we are going to come together and take on the bjp and throw the bjp out in 2024 been a bit more rocky since then um many members of that alliance have accused the congress party of not being proactive in the entire build up to the assembly elections not being responsive to seat sharing then you have certain members of that alliance who've been making statements about the north south divide for example which have led to a lot of controversy uh, have annoyed other members of the alliance uh, there was supposed to be a, have been a meeting on the 6th it was postponed so things are obviously not very well right now in the opposition and it's a bad time for things not to be well in the indian opposition because there's a very big general election coming and they are up against a really formidable opponent in narendra modi or someone who's riding particularly high after the state elections so where do we go from here as a country what's the bjp going to do what's the opposition going to do and what does all of this mean for 2024 well let me just throw this straight to some of the experts now so joining us for a lot more on that shashi and me spokesperson of the bjp anshula vijit is with us national spokesperson of the congress party uh, mr a sarvanan uh, spokesperson of the dmk is joining us in just a couple of minutes and nirja choudhury political analyst with us uh, as, as well um let me let me start with you shashi because obviously you've got a a smile on your face which is going to keep on getting wider i think uh, you know as this conversation goes on were you really expecting this sort of a victory and with that sort of a margin all three heartland states well i was on your show vikram and i did say that we will get full support from the people of chatisgarh madhya pradesh and rajasthan and we will have absolute uh, we will uh, will be in the clear and we will have majority and clear wins in all the three states and that's exactly what's happened it's been a clear win yes the margins are are huge and uh, very encouraging and just goes on to show that you know modi guarantee matters anshul if i could turn to you you know the points that shazia makes 
you have to consider what actually happened in 2018 and 19 to sort of look at the the situation of the Congress Party and, and others find themselves, especially when it comes to the heartland. Yes, the Congress Party won in Telangana, and that is something I'm going to talk about, what's happening in the South. But in the heartland, let's remember 2018 to 2019, there was almost an 8 or 10 percentage point jump once Narendra Modi becomes comes on the ticket, once it becomes a question of making Narendra Modi the Prime Minister. That's what happened 18 to 19. So if you look at Madhya Pradesh at 48% right now, Chhattisgarh with 46% for the BJP, Rajasthan 42% for the BJP. You add 10 percentage points to that, it looks as if the BJP is again heading for a sweep across the Hindi heartland. Would, would that be a fair summary to make of these uh, assembly elections? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, if you go by the 2018 elections, then the reversal happened. So if that is any indication, then the India Alliance is all set to win the Hindi heartland. No, no, hang on, hang on. The, the, reversal happened, the reversal happened because the Congress had won assembly elections. Then you added the Narendra Modi factor to that when it came to the general election. And the BJP got 10% more. There's no reason that in a general election, when you have the Narendra Modi factor being added to it, the BJP will not get extra vote share. It's not going to be detracted from it. At least yeah, not on the basis of anything we've seen so far. Sure, sure. You're making a qualitative point. I was making a statistical point. Uh, look, uh, it doesn't matter. Look, um, the, the India alliance is, I believe, to be a strong alliance and an alliance that can counter the BJP or the whatever you call the Modi factor. One thing very heartening is, and I, I don't think we're clutching at straws, is that the vote percentage in all these three states, despite the reversal, has remained consistent at around about 40% or, or thereabouts. Which means that uh, you know the welfareism, which which uh, Modi, uh, which the Prime Minister has contorted or, or you know used a distasteful word like "rabidi" always, um, has actually worked in that area. So there was no uh, sort of anti-incumbency in Chhattisgarh or in Rajasthan. Um, the, there was a, a there was a setback in Madhya Pradesh. We'll address that setback, but I think that. It, over and above, and even when you consider the popular vote, uh, something that is very heartening to our carders, uh, you take what you get in an election, is that we've got more of the popular vote, about 10 lakh more than the BJP has got overall. Look, let's face it, when you look at 2019 and look at that for 2024, BJP pretty much reached saturation in the heartland states. Some analysis has been done to say, you know, even if the BJP starts losing three seats here or three seats there, the Congress vote was consolidated in certain seats. So purely on that basis, they would be winning some seats. You probably need to figure, if the, if the question is really going to be, is the BJP going to be dropping seats or not from that 303? And if so, by how much? Uh, it was a sweep in the heartland, as I'm, as I'm saying once again last time around. So it's only yours to lose so, seats from so, there. Yes. So, Vikram, first things first, talking about the guarantee. Yes, everybody makes promises. So, there are pre-election SOPs and there are, there are budgetary allocations. And there is management of the economy, which you've seen how well BJP is done there, where that is concerned. But, uh, and that is what I was talking about, the credibility of one party over the others in terms of delivery and having be and to ensure better mechanisms to ensure the delivery of all the promises that are made by all parties at all times but and now let's look at the if you look at 2019 elections so what bjp won more than 105 seats and actually won 105 seats with a margin of 3 lakh votes now if you look at uh, convert the, this victory also that we have in the three big states uh, and we keep calling it hindi heartland as if almost like a some people use it as a pejorative, as if, uh, you know, um, be, uh, there is something wrong with being part of the Hindi heartland. But I really would like to ask uh, the Alliance uh, partners if they are if they are there. I mean, it, it seems like it's going to be, and then there were none, the way they all seem to be parting ways. Okay, let me throw that question. Let me throw that question. Whether, how do they take DMK's clear aversion to not just Sanatan, but Hindus, Brahmins, Hindi, and I, all that is part of Hindutva. Two questions, um, uh, Anshul, which I think are, are fair to ask. Number one, the India Alliance uh, was almost sort of put on the back burner for two, three months. I think the Congress Party was hoping to get 
a really good performance in these uh, state as assembly elections so that it would have a good bargaining position. As it turns out, you're going to be going in for seat sharing discussions with the India Alliance on a slightly back foot. So question number one, will there actually be a concrete seat sharing agreement and a common minimum program that the India Alliance will be able to work out to take on the BJP? What you say, what was the interregnum was necessary because the elections were taking place. We had to fight those elections with all kinds of, uh, with all focus. So that was something that, well, could really be avoided. As soon as the elections got over, we said, no, no, we're going to regroup and we're going to meet. Look, they will, you know, in the heat of elections, things are said. Um, that has always been the case. I'll give you the example of the UPA, where so many things were said. Um, you know, there were differences between parties, but that didn't prevent a coalition, a robust coalition from, uh, from being in this country, from being in power for 10 years, which gave a strong economy of an average of over 8%, which was really a gift to this government, which, which was precipitously plummeted to minus 6.6 .6 or 7 point something. And now the economy since then has been really thrown under the bus. We're still struggling to recover. So I'll that give is you not the example. true. That is not true. Kazia, just, the yeah, yeah. Well, will you get, I'll give you an answer. No, no, no. No, they're, they're, it's absolutely true that it went into negative. And, you know, by demonetization, which was an economic act of economic violence against this country, there okay. was a participant's decline in, in, the, in the growth rate of the economy. That is absolutely true. These are government figures. All right. No, I'm just Can saying I... so after that, the demonetization, that the coalition government won in gave a strong with government. huge numbers. And no, no, not sure. just that's that, if you point. look at the growth rate now, if we're looking at a 7% growth rate no, no, at that's this point of, of time, it's effect. the fastest growing so the fastest growing economy in the world. Base effect. Anshul, no matter what you say, you can get into semantics and all kinds of analysis. The no, fact no, of the matter point, is, Shadi it's the fastest growing economy, that there is no doubt. No, no, I, I understand. My larger point is that we ran a coalition government which one has cast so many doubts about, and one is hasty among various sections to write its obituary, ran a particular co a co strong coalition government for 10 years. Okay. That's but Anshul, that's fact. a point. Anshul, that's a point. Maybe time, pe people want a decisive government in power. And a we decisive had one. leader in power. And that was the moment the of India shining, Shazia. Then the ragtag coalition politics. Then the ragtag coalition but politics, got voted again. which has its own compulsion. The second time and round, you, how do you say UPA too then? With all pitfalls all right. of a coalition Ninja. government and all the pulls and pressures of a coalition government. All right, mm. let me just let me just get get the others in, in, into this particular discussion, uh, Shazia Nashal, just for a sec. Neerja, analyze this for us, right? I mean, obviously, major setback for the Congress Party. BJP looking particularly buoyant right now, and everyone's saying that it's now a smooth uh, sailing to 2024. A couple of commentators coming and saying, no, hang on, hang on, there's still some months to go, things could happen, you know, maybe the alliance will come up, maybe there'll be seed sharing. Is it a given that it's Narendra Modi back for a third term? And if, it, if it's not a given, why is it not a given? What could the opposition do to change the game? Well, you know, I, I was thinking of 1971 when somebody had asked Indira Gandhi before the elections, what is the issue in this election? A foreign journalist had posed that question. She said, I am the issue. 1980, again, this question was asked of her and she is the issue. Now, today, Narendra Modi is the issue. In any election, whether it's state elections or national election, it is the Prime Minister's face, and I agree with Shazia. There is an element of trust. Trust is the right word. The, what is encapsulated in that slogan, Modi's guarantee. Nija, if I could just, uh, if I could just uh, understand what that. you're saying. Nija, if I could understand what you're saying. If it becomes yeah, it a is. referendum on Narendra Modi, there's no yes. signs that Narendra Modi's popularity is any lower yes. than it was. If anything, it might well Absolutely. have increased. So Can if it becomes a referendum on Narendra it, Modi, He's going to win rather comfortably. The opposition's only way to handle this is to not allow it to be a referendum on him. Tougher to do in a general election, I guess. Yes, absolutely tougher to do it. And it is, um, you know, I, I can't remember any prime minister being continuing to be popular at the end of 10 years. Nehru, leave Nehru out, but even by 52, he won 62. His health was not good. They won the election. Yeah. Indira Gandhi, 67, won the election, 77, rout. 
Manmohan Singh, they won the election very expect, unexpectedly 2004, 2014 out. So it is, I agree with you, it is around Narendra Modi, his politics, his persona, his whatever, his PMO and the way he rules, etc., etc. Now, what does the India Alliance do to counter it? How do they, whether it's the narrative, they are not yeah. clear. They are doing temple hopping, but it's not having, uh, you know, what Kamal Nath put into motion or with uh, what, along with social welfareism. Okay. But, and the, this side has to get its narrative right. And I must say this was disappointing. Hours after the defeat, the regional parties are mounting an attack on the Congress party. Astonishing. A member All of right, the Nija, let me throw that. And failure. If there's failure, they hold their hands. They can slug it out within the four walls of a room. All right, it Mr. Sarvanan. the country. All right, Mr. Sarvanan, let me throw that to you. Where, yes. What happens to the India alliance now? Uh, as Neerja was just saying, you know, in a sense, agreeing with what Shazia is saying, it's about the personality of Narendra Modi. There's a lot of confidence. Tough to see how that's going to be overwritten in three or four months or five months or six months by the opposition. In the aftermath of this defeat, we've seen a couple of things happening which are showing just how difficult the situation actually is for the India Alliance. Number one, the bickering which is going to now be taking place over seed sharing. We've already seen the first shots being fired. And certainly the, the job of the, the parties in North India, the Congress or anyone to take on the BJP, there is not going to be made simpler by, for example, DMK MPs coming out and making, you know, calling the north of India you know, Gaubutra states. Uh, statements like that are certainly going to only give Shazia an even bigger smile on her face than she does right now. Yeah. Uh, if you look at these uh, three state elections where the BJP has won, see, we can perfectly understand what's happened in Rajasthan and what's happened in Chhattisgarh because anti-incumbency, people choose to uh, ignore the party in power. They want to change. So this is perfectly understandable. But the Congress should have won uh, Madhya Pradesh. I don't know why they have not uh, done that. See, the, another problem is this. If the Congress is going to pedal soft in the Twa, People are not going to vote for them because BJP is there, which is the bigger Hindutva brother, which does it in a better way. So Mr. Rahul Gandhi has set the narrative in a proper way. OBC reservation, he has said the caste uh, the caste uh, uh, ceiling should uh, reservation ceiling should go up. See that that is the way in Bihar they have done that. There is no point. There is uh, no logic in fighting the BJP where it is stronger. And the BJP is a party which is not bothered about the other Hindus. The BJP is a party for the upper caste Hindus. And that is that is how they have uh, uh, done that. And that is where the Congress has to take a leaf out of the book of the DMK or the Dravidian ideology and fight for social justice. Okay, so let me just are... ask you, Mr. Let me just ask you, Mr. Yes. Sarvanan, in Tamil Nadu, of course, seed sharing will presumably be worked out because it's been done many times in the past. How, two specific questions let me throw to you. Number one, do you think the India Alliance will be able to put together a seat sharing agreement? Point number one. Point number two, do you think you will be able to agree on a common manifesto or common action plan, an uh, actual charter of action that you can take to the nation and saying, well, the BJP is going to do this, we are going to do the other? Because just attacking the personality of the Prime Minister may not necessarily get you, get you too far. Yeah, see, you're right. See, we were able to do that. We will be able to do that because we have been doing this for so long, at least the DMK party from 1967. When we started winning elections, see, it's it started uh, coming to power. It's all about rainbow coalitions. See, one of the reasons is that it makes inclusive. See, you cannot represent the uh, wide, varied interests and aspirations of every section of the population. One party or two parties cannot do that. That is why we have coalitions. If you look at the silver lining of these three state elections, it's just a thin margin. It's not the persona of Mr. Narendra Modi, which has won the election for the BJP, which is the nitty gritty on the ground level. It is the uh, non uh, ensuring that uh, the other uh, <coughs> votes does not come to Congress. Probably the Congress should have had an alliance, then the results would have been different. So this is not just Mr. Narendra Modi becoming uh, uh, invincible. That is not the situation on the ground. All so right. we are very Fine. confident me... that we'll be able to dethrone them. 
All right. Let me. I mean, yes and no. If you, have, if, you know, the BJP is getting 48 percent, even if the opposition comes together, it's tough to win, win, win those sort of seats. But very quickly, we are out of time. We're just going to get a one line, two line from the others uh, to sort of wrap up out here. Uh, Anshul, very, very quickly, do you think? How confident are you that yes, seat sharing will be done and an agenda will be drawn up, and that the Congress will be perhaps somewhat chastened enough to say we need to listen to others and take everyone with us? You know, there is no question of any arrogance. We know what our motive, uh, what the goal is, what the target is. We have no choice except to come together, and we will. Uh, I mean, all these comments aside that usually happen in politics, after all, not to forget that this is politics. And I think it's actually good for the alliance when apprehensions are openly articulated or expressed. I don't think there's anything bad in it. Why shouldn't there be? We will come together, and after that, we will have a common minimum program, and we will win this election. All right, Nirja, very quickly. The, the, th the thing we've just heard from both the DMK and the Congress, there is no choice now. Paradoxically, could that be something that does hold the India alliance together? Because they're, I think, probably realize there's very little choice right now. They are staring at something in the face, uh, and there's, there's little choice for them to try and figure out what to do and do it together. Yes, absolutely. I think they have no option but to come together. And the secret is going to be to have one-on-one -on -one contests against the BJP in the 400 Lok Sabha seats that they have already earmarked. But, you know, the opposition tends to get very demoralized very quickly. Of course, there, there is a formidable foe on the other side. No doubt about that. But uh, I think uh, there is simply no option but to, for them to come together. All right, Shazia, is that something that so, would concern the BJP at all? That, you know, obviously you're, you're riding high right now, but in a position where the opposition has no choice but to try and do things differently or try and come together, um, BJP is not known to be a party that is complacent in any way or to sit back on its laurels. So presumably you're still proceeding on, you know, trying to figure out what the answers yes. to that are. Yes, on, on the contrary, and I would like to say very humbly and submit to all of you that whilst the uh, INDI alliance has little choice, people of India have a, have a choice, and that choice clearly is Narendra Modi and BJP. Uh, Neerja ji was talking about the, the slugfest that went on after the defeat or the debacle that the three states saw. Uh, even during the elections, they were calling each other out. And we know what the kind of words Akhilesh Yadav and uh, Nitish ji have had to say for Rahul Gandhi. And not just that, uh, even after uh, now the newly elected, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chief Minister of Telangana, uh, the comments he makes about KCR and insults Biharis and Bihari DNA, how does that work well for uh, INDI Alliance, which clearly has little choice but to huddle together? How does it go well for their cadres and their ranks okay. to be insulted so? I guess those are all questions that will have to be seen and uh, let, let's wait for the next big meeting of the India Alliance to see what actually happens out there. Thank you all so much for joining us. Really interesting. To... Yeah, uh, sorry, you're quickly saying one last word? Yes, Mr. yes, Sir. yeah. See, see, the BJP, the BJP, the common man is totally disappointed with the BJP. It is their machinations <laughs> that is winning them if the election. If they were election. so disappointed, fool, why are they voting for them again and again, Mr. Sarvanan? It's easy to say the common man is disappointed. 48% of people Just voted for them in Madhya Pradesh. What? Hello? I'm saying if the what people are say? so disappointed, why are they voting for them again and again? See, that is what Madhya Pradesh is a different different ball game. That's what the Congress yeah, has to really introspect. Ballgame. But I'm speaking about in Rajasthan, <laughs> in Chhattisgarh, in Karnataka, okay. in Maharashtra. You think uh, you think uh, everybody is so happy with the Congress? Sorry, with the BJP. If they are so happy, what share? What share would have been different? All right. Well, the India but Alliance partners are definitely not happy won. with you. They did not able. They were not able to India do that. India Alliance they partners are, are definitely not happy this. with you. I don't know about the country. Is flowing on but, the roads. Uh, but the Alliance what partners the are percentage? not happy with you at the all. The vote percentage all right. I'm... says it all for everybody. <laughs> All right. I would have called it a truce. Well within the BJP, they are not even able to select their chief ministers. In All right. I would have called it a truce Please. on this particular episode of the India story, and we'll, we'll come back to it. This is uh, we've, we've heard a lot of the points. Interesting roadmaps being laid out there. Interesting points being made out there, which will be crucial. The next three to four months promise to be really interesting and crucial. Uh, a crucial time in India will. The fact that Narendra Modi is riding high right now, will he be able to make a referendum uh, uh, on himself and therefore sweep the election in 2024? Or will the opposition actually find 
the ability and the chance to come together in a meaningful manner in the next few weeks and perhaps have a rival agenda. Well, as the famous cliche says, only time will tell. Okay, let's move now to uh, another one of our regular segments, what the global press is actually saying about India. And obviously, there's a lot of coverage of those uh, assembly elections. The New York Times, for example, saying that it's a big advantage now for the BJP as the state victories have expanded Prime Minister Modi's dominance uh, in the country. Uh, Nikkei Asia, meanwhile, uh, looked at something else. It says that Mumbai could now lead the world in the number of IPOs as new China listings have fallen. It says that Mumbai is all set to lead. 45% rise in IPOs, leaving behind the major Chinese financial uh, sector. So that's that report in Nikkei Asia. And CNN Business has the important question, can India become rich and go green at the same time? Re in reference to COP28, of course, uh, CNN Business was speaking about the fact that net zero emission uh, commitments made by Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi by 2070 reflect a significant commitment and a major uh, step forward potentially for sustainability, asking the question that can India be green while at the same time developing really, really fast. And let's turn now to one of our newsmakers of the week. So Mr. Mukherjee, former congressperson, daughter of Pranab Mukherjee, the former president of India, who's just written a book, Pranab, My Father, A Daughter Remembers, which has led to a certain amount of a ruckus. And Shamisha Mukherjee now, now joins us on the India story. Uh, Shamisha, thank you so much for being with us. As I said a certain amount of ruckus uh, after excerpts of your book came out, specifically from the Congress Party. About some of the remarks that you mentioned, you say, for example, that your, that your father made some remarks about Rahul Gandhi, about him being immature and the like. How, how do you respond uh, to all of those controversies that have broken out? Well, I wouldn't like to respond to it in the sense uh, it's, uh, I believe in freedom of expression. And I do also believe that the Congress Party, the Congress ideology upholds the freedom of expression. So the way I have said certain things, and my father has said some certain things, written certain things in his diary, and I have stated that, I have a right to do so. And how people react to it, they also have the right to you know, react in whatever way uh, they want to. So that is their uh, right. I mean, I, why should I comment on that? Well, Shamisha Ji, we've heard a lot of Congress people saying that, of course, your father had such a distinguished career, rising all the way to be the president. They said he was always close to the party. He gave a lot to the Congress party, but also that the Congress party gave a lot back to him. The, those have been some of the reactions that we've been hearing uh, from the Congress. Well, of course, you know, my father was a product of Congress, you know, but also, you know, he gave his life to Congress. So it is a both way interaction, it is a give and take. And you know, this is a very common uh, practice I have seen in Congress while I was within the party or even now outside, though I'm still a primary member of Congress and I believe in Congress ideology, that you know, anybody you know, quitting Congress, leaving Congress or making some criticism of the things even remaining, immediately they just, you know, the Congress trolls, the Congress social media, uh, uh, and in some cases, for example, in Gulam Nabi Azad Ji, who's a very senior stalwart leader of Congress, you know, some people just jump at him that, you know, they have uh, got so much from the party, which is very true. But Congress is also not just one particular family. Every leader, every worker contributed, has contributed to its growth. And senior leaders, you know, they have devoted their entire life to Congress. So it is not just in a domain of, uh, uh, and also criticism of one particular individual uh, should not be, you know, be taken as equivalent to criticizing the party. The party is much greater than any individual or than any family. So that is something, you know, one, I, I think it like that. And as you had your earlier question, what you were saying, you know, it's perhaps also a response to that. My father, as I say, he was a product of Congress. He is a die-hard congressman who believed in Congress ideology until the very last, uh, uh, you know, uh, until his last breath, in the last day. And uh, he has seen various ups and downs of the party, 
starting from his associate his uh, days of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. You know, he was a part of it when the party split. You know, when within the Congress party, how Indira Gandhi was totally marginalized within CWC. You know, how leaders who once said Indira is India, uh, they how they started decrying her and uh, you know deposed against her during the Shah Commission. Uh, then how the party was split, you know, then how Indira Gandhi fought back and, you know, came with a glorious return. So he was all part of this. But Shambhi Chaji, the other thing, of course, as you're saying, is a congressman uh, till, till the day he became the president. But in the last few years of his life, he also seemed to have had a very close, uh, interesting re relationship with Prime Minister Narendra Modi, almost a sort of a very close bond between the two of them seemed to have emerged. Did you also get that feeling in your own conversations with him? Some of that is reflected in the book as well. Yes, definitely. But before coming to that, I would like to point out that my father also had very close relationships throughout his political life from, you know, not just political, even personal, very good personal relationships from leaders, senior leaders from left like Jyoti Basu, to the right, like Arun Jetli, uh, LK Advani, they were, you know, my father would always say that in politics, you know, there are opponents, there are not enemies. So, you know, he had this tremendous rela good relationship with people across party line, and that's why he was known as a consensus, consensus generator. When he became the president, and, you know, when, after two years, when Mr. No Modi, from a very different political, ideological background, became the prime minister, you know, one of the reasons, I think, of course, the goodwill my father already had developed over the course of five decades of being in politics across political party line. Secondly, also the reason that my father was a copybook president. You know, he was very clear about the constitutional role and the limitation of the president. And uh, thirdly, there was, of course, this, you know, tremendous personal chemistry between the two leaders. Right. So, so which, which was there, which I have also witnessed, and I have also written about in the book. Well, of course, you know, the achievements are always very well known, much talked about also there in the book. Right? Uh, I'm curious, in, in your personal conversations with Pranabda, were there any aspects of his career or his life that, you know, he looked back and said, I could have done that differently. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. I mean, I don't know, retrospective tax, for example, or something else, which he feels he could have done things differently. You know, about retrospective taxation, I did not venture to even get into that because I don't understand anything about economics. And, uh, you know, my father, uh, if anybody, if you have ever interacted with him, I mean, he would get very irritated if you go uh, to him without doing proper homework. Uh, for example, once he, in the parliament, you know, he, uh, 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 the opposition was creating a ruckus and he, he said that, you know, behave like mature leaders, don't behave, behave like uh, juvenile kids or uh, something like that. And uh, then, uh, you know, he apologized to them. All right, Mr. Mukherjee, thank you so much for joining us on that, on that new book. And that's all we have time for on this episode of The India Story. But we'll be back again next week with all the big stories from India and the big experts to help us understand them. Bye for now.